Atlantic City, New Jersey, welcomes the fourth council meeting of an organization which is of major importance to the whole world. The United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration, UNRWA, represented by 47 nations, convenes to solve the food famine which threatens more than half a billion people left destitute by war. President Truman's plea that Americans voluntarily share part of their food supply to help feed the many faced with starvation is applauded by UNRWA delegates from all parts of the world. UNRWA's retiring Director General, Herbert H. Lehman, who will be succeeded by former New York Mayor LaGuardia, speaks for brotherhood among nations. The basic problems of understanding between men and between nations exist today as certainly as they existed generations ago. UNRWA has now given the first simple proof that this understanding can be attained. Now let the leaders of the United Nations profit by that experience and lead their peoples to a world of peace and security. The United States Navy presents first pictures of its peacetime Mars flying boat, world's largest plane. Designed for cargo, it lifts the greatest weight and has the longest range and is the Navy's successor to its wartime Mars, which supplied the far-flung Pacific outposts. The Marshall Mars is the first of four such giant cargo craft destined for service with the Navy's air transport service. They will all be named for islands wrested from the Japanese. Four huge motors give the ship a top speed of over 200 miles an hour, fast for a seaplane. Her wingspan is 200 feet and her gross weight over 80 tons. Carrying more gas than a large railroad tank car, she's off to the Hawaiian Islands on the first leg of regular flights to the Philippines. Over San Francisco Bay, she gives a farewell salute to the famous Golden Gate Bridge. At Wichita, Kansas, in the very center of the United States, the housing problem brings out a circular dwelling built of aluminum and plastics. Instead of a foundation, this cornerless cottage is suspended from a central mast of stainless steel. The engineering principle, with the safety factor of a suspension bridge, permits new ideas like a revolving roof, which gives a complete change of air every six minutes. Using a model, the inventor shows how circular design makes the best use of floor space. Using new war-developed lightweight metals, and prefabrication of parts by mass production, this home of living room, two bedrooms, two baths, and a kitchen can be economically produced and will contain a compact heating and air conditioning unit. House hunters find many pleasant surprises. The clothes closet appears with a flick of the finger and a built-in dust-proof hat rack. But most interesting of all is the conveyor belt linen closet. Recessed in the wall, the press of a button rotates the conveyor shelves. A roundhouse may seem strange, but in a housing shortage, people are giving attention to all new ideas. Steaming north, bound for polar seas, the aircraft carrier Midway is on Arctic maneuvers. She has an escort of three destroyers, and a pipeline passed to the carrier refuels the small, short-range vessels. The planes are covered against the cold. Masked against the bitter weather, the men experiment with protection for equipment in the far north. Hoses pump warm air into covered planes to keep motors from freezing. Bitter winds whip and lash at the vessel. Frost and snow present a problem, and on deck the sailors test out the latest fashions for Arctic maneuvers.
mechanical brush sweeps clear the flight deck for the plane takeoffs. The propellers are turned over for a flight over the Arctic ice cap. Special cables are attached to the planes, which take off with the aid of catapult equipment. Headed into the wind, the carrier gives her planes every advantage for the hazardous takeoff. Admiral Cassidy, commander of the task force, scans the nearby polar ice pack over which his planes are flying in the first tests of modern carriers against the biting cold of the Arctic. Trout spawning time in New Zealand. Government laboratory experts come to collect eggs to keep lakes and streams stocked with fish. Catching the trout comes first. Neatly netted, the fish are tipped into a box, are stripped of their eggs and then released. Trout eggs, few of which would hatch under normal conditions. At the government hatcheries, the eggs show first signs of life the eyes, which show as black spots. And this is how the trout look when first hatched. The yolk sacs remain attached until they can feed by mouth. They take final form, each as long as a little finger, ready to start life in a fishing stream or lake to which they go in special cans. And they are poured out by the hundreds. They'll grow up into specimens like these to provide sport and food for the fishermen. At its temporary headquarters in Hunter College in New York City, the Security Council of the United Nations Organization opens its session. The delegates arrive at the Hunter College campus for this historic event, inaugurating UNO's permanent residence in the United States. Dr. Kuo Tai Chi of China, Acting Security Council Chairman, and Trigby Lee, Secretary General of UNO. More members of the Council meet the press. Andre Gromyko, Soviet Ambassador to the United States, is joined by Henri Bonnet of France, United States Delegate Statinius, and Sir Alexander Cadogan of England. The first major problem to be faced by the Security Council was the Russian-Iranian situation. Secretary of State James Burns insisted that the Russia-Iran controversy be taken up immediately by the Council. The few spectators from the general public for whom seats are available file in to watch the machinery of international unity begin to function. In the newly decorated chamber, before an audience composed mainly of invited world officials and newsmen, the first session of the Council is recorded by newsreel cameras. The 11 members of the Security Council have as their duty the preservation of world peace. China's Dr. Kuo opens the meeting. He will preside during the first month. Expressing the hopes and will of millions of people in all nations, Secretary of State Burns addresses the Council. On all the members of the United Nations, there rests the duty to cooperate with the Council in order to enable it to meet its responsibility. They must be willing freely and frankly to discuss their grievances before this council. Questions affecting the peace of the world must not be treated as questions of honor which cannot be discussed. Questions of honor between individuals are no longer left to the ordeal of the duel. Questions of honor between nations can no longer be left to the ordeal of the battle. Now, we must live by the charter that 
is the road to peace. And the road to peace is the road the peoples of the world now want to travel. <laughs> <laughs>